So this talk is a preliminary sketch of the Chinese Revolution from an anarchist perspective. Uh, and really the reason that I decided to do it was in 2004, um, I think I read that biography of Mao and I thought, oh, I'd like to you know, find out a bit more. So I went Googling looking for an article, I couldn't find anything at all. Uh, and then I, I was in Washington DC and I went looking for books and I couldn't really find anything. It's amazing, there isn't aren't any really good left from history to the whole event. Uh, what you have are kind of Maoist, uh, what's the word, biographies, you know, like biographies. just Maoist super type books, uh, and then various kind of you know, mainstream right wing ones that don't tell you very much. I'm not claiming to make any big breakthroughs here, I don't speak Chinese, I don't have any access to original sources, so all I've done is got you know, that thickness of books, read them, read what I could find out about the anarchist movement, and included that. So the modern revolutionary tradition in China. Uh, can be considered to start really in the 1850s, and that's with something almost nobody has ever heard of, which is the Taiping insurrection. Um, and this was a massive peasant insurrection. Uh, interest, interestingly enough, the main ideas within it were kind of uh, heretical Christian ones. Um, and uh, in the wars, it spread over half of the land area of China. Something like 20 million people probably died in the course of it. Uh, it came very close to overthrowing the, uh, the Chang regime at the time. And in fact, uh, the Western powers intervened, and that probably helped uh, save the Chang. Uh, but the Chang were having a pretty tough time with the West itself. The other thing that most people are vaguely aware of from that period of Chinese history is they've heard about the Opium Wars. So the opium wars are when the Chinese ruling class decide that they're not that keen on Britain importing opium into China and selling it to the peasantry. It's having all sorts of bad effects and it's also badly affecting the silver balance. Uh, so they decide to try and stop it. Um, but whereas until the 16 or 1700s, China had been you know, probably the most advanced civilization in the then world, probably had the most advanced military, a huge gap has opened up in the 200 years in between. So you have um, junks, uh, going up against relatively modern British, in particular, Navy vessels with multiple cannons. This somewhat idealised sketch from a Chinese point of view, I suspect, seems to show a load of junk sinking one of these vessels. I don't think that really happened at all. Uh, the Navy took a hammering. And as a result, uh, the Chinese were forced to open up the country. Now, it wasn't just the British who were involved in this. This was a big imperial carve-up. Um, so as well as the British, you were talking about the Germans, uh, the Italians, the French, and interestingly the Japanese. Uh, the Chinese state failed to modernise when it was faced with these challenges, but the Japanese state reacted quite differently, and they actually modernised, created a modern army, and as a result, uh, I mean the Chinese had refreshed had referred to the Japanese as the dwarves. You know, they had a fairly derogatory view of the Japanese, but suddenly the Japanese are colonizing. First of all, they took Korea, and then as the 20th century went on, they in fact took a large chunk of North uh, China. So they were very much part <coughs> of the imperialist carver. Towards the end of the century, at the start of the 20th century, uh, the Chang made the last desperate military attempt uh, to change things, and that's by you know, giving the unofficial go-ahead to the Boxer Rebellion. Again, that's another thing most people have heard about in terms of Chinese history. Uh, so the Boxer Rebellion, the rank and file, are kind of poor peasants and people that have been dispossessed by modernisation, but it's led by all sorts of reactionary officials of the Chang regime. Uh, and it's really also really uh, xenophobic, so in fact the main victims of the Boxer Rebellion are uh, Chinese Christians. And um, right towards the end of it, when it looks a bit successful, the Chang officially come on board, and that gives the Western powers and Japan an excuse to really come down hard on them. Um, so basically the Chinese army at the time is no match for these Western armies that are all very modern, they've military, modern training and they've modern equipment. Uh, and they very quickly take uh, Peking and impose a new settlement. It's probably, uh, yeah, one, one thing that's worth remembering is uh, after this, Kaiser William II uh, said that to punish the Chinese state, or to punish the Chinese in general, he was going to make the German remembered in China for a thousand years so that no China man, China man would ever again dare to even squint at a German. Um, and in fact, that's, that's a, he, he, he drew a comparison with the Huns, and that's why uh, the British in the, second, in the First World War used to refer to the Germans as Huns, because this became quite famous in the British press. So China's actually quite central in terms of the, um, you know, the growing imperialist rivalry. The Chang themselves, the ruling regime at the time, they reacted to the defeat by escalating the reform progress they were trying to do. Now, the problem they had with the reform progress uh, was in order to make real reforms, they actually had to attack 
uh, the landlord class, uh, and they had, had to attack the traditional bureaucracy, but these were the same people running the state. So what you have for about 20 or 30 years is this long process of somebody trying to make reforms, going too far and getting executed, and reforms being overturned. After 1900, though, when it becomes much more urgent, uh, they start to introduce some real reforms. But that really, in fact, is part of their undoing. Uh, they introduce a new modern army, and they introduce a new university system. And those two institutions basically breed a whole generation of Republican revolutionaries that are then going to go on and overthrow the old regime. So one of these, and uh, probably most famous, is Sun Yat-sen. He'd been involved in trying to organize Republican insurrections in China from about 1895. Um, and in Tokyo in 1905, he formed the Revolutionary Alliance, which became the Kuomintang, or KMT, or the Nationalist School, so called in Chinese history. At the time, this is a very broad organization, and it even includes many of the early anarchists. Um, and uh, Sun Yat-sen actually encouraged the process of anarchists joining the KMT as late as 1924. He said that the ultimate goal of his uh, principle of people's livelihood was communism and anarchism. And that's also the first hint you have of how widespread anarchist ideas were in terms of the, the kind of mobilised Republican movement. October the 10th, 1911, is remembered as the birth of the Republic. It's celebrated as the birth of the Republic. Uh, essentially what happened is in Wu Chang, uh, governor discovered a plot, it caused panic, and it started this kind of tidal wave of uh, basically just things falling apart. The Chang had become rotten and things came apart. Um, so it was crashing, the, the Chang regime came crashing down and it wasn't brought down by some sort of unified revolutionary mo movement that had a definite program, that had a definite idea of change, but rather by just everybody suddenly turning against us. Uh, now everybody included this guy who is Yong Sha Kei, maybe mispronouncing that name for sure. Uh, he's actually a, a Chang general. And in 1911, during the, the Republican revolutions, he first of all fought on the Chang side. He carried out massacres of captured Republicans. Uh, but he was also the commander of one of the main Chang firm, uh, reforms, which was the Beiying Army. Now, this was an attempt at building a modern army, and it was quite a powerful military force. So basically, he attacked the Republican areas, stormed the cities, massacred the revolutionaries, and then went, well, you know, I've got the balance of power here, so let's see who's going to give me the most. So out of that, he becomes president of China in 1912, and the Chang deposed. Sun Yat-sen uh, declares a second republic in 1913, attempts to have another insurrection, but the, the revolutionaries at this stage are no match for the Beijing army. And basically, uh, Yong Shao Kai starts reinstituting the old system and even tries to make himself emperor in 1915. Now that's going too far, and it basically splits uh, the new government. Uh, he dies in 1916, and from this period on, you get what's called the warlord period. Now, again, most people in connection with China have heard of the warlords. So what were the warlords? So what happens at this point is basically the whole country breaks up into lots and lots of factions where basically you're the local military commander, you control this particular area, so you become the de facto ruler of that area. And these factions enter into different alliances with each other. So what this map shows isn't the individuals, but it's actually showing you the major factions and how they related to each other, with the KMT initially being in the south here. This lifted from Wikipedia gives you an idea of just how confused the situation is. This is the factions just in the northern half of the country, right? So there's, you know, there's probably two or three dozen uh, major cliques, uh, there's a few dozen minor ones, and then there's some new ones coming in the course of this. The important thing about this was this was a period of complete chaos. There was constant warfare going on between these factions, and some of these wars were huge. They involved a million soldiers on either side. Uh, they were continually uh, conscripting peasantry. Being a peasant in China was pretty miserable anyway, but in this period of constant warfare, you were, you were constantly losing your sons to the army. Uh, the army was treated really badly. Large percentages would just die of starvation. Um, and the other thing that would happen is the local warlord would come in and collect the tax, not just for this year, but for the next 30 years. And then his rival would come in and collect the tax, not just for this year, but for the next 30 years. Uh, Life was pretty precarious anyway, so this basically meant where you could pay this was going massively in hock, where it's the local money lender, you had a crop failure, you lost your land, and you starved to death. So tens of millions of people died during this period. The lesson drawn by, uh, 
from all this chaos by the new generation of young revolutionaries was that traditional Chinese society would have to be actively smashed before any real progress could be made in modernizing the country. There was no use talking about reform. Now, this position had, in fact, been argued uh, by uh, Chinese anarchists who were exiled in Paris since 1907. They published 100 issues of a journal called New Era, and it had also come in part from uh, Chinese anarchists in exile in Tokyo. They were both sending lots of material back into the country. In terms of conventional Chinese history, though, uh, this guy is credited with the idea, Chen Duxu, and the reason for that is he went on later on to form the Communist Party, so it kind of fits into you know, uh, official ideology. Uh, he was going to be a little bit problematical as well, though, uh, and he formed the New Youth Movement, which appeared in 1915, and the basic argument of the New Youth Movement was that commu- uh, Confucian morality, that's the kind of ideology that had ruled the country and the state really for two and a half thousand years, had to be turned upside down. Uh, and youth and innovation had to be lauded over age and experience and tradition, which were previously like a kind of high things. Um, so in this period, in fact for a long period, up to as late as 1925, it's true to say that the majority of the radical end of the revolutionary movement in China were anarchists rather than Marxists. Um, many anarchist texts were being translated, were translated in fact by the time of the 1911 revolution. It was kind of the main idea, really, in terms of a lot of, uh, a lot of revolutionary ideology. Uh, there was no significant translation of Marxist texts, in fact, until 1920, really until after the Russian Revolution, quite a bit afterwards. Um, and one historian, a guy called Dillock, says that there was no Marxist left to speak of in China until 1920-21. Most of those who were to emerge as leaders of the communist movement in China went through an anarchist phase uh, before they became Marxists. So, here are four Chinese anarchists. Um, Quinn Ling was executed uh, for uh, uh, attempting to assassinate court officials. Din Ling here was uh, one of the main, she's kind of the main uh, female Chinese writer of the period, very famous character, uh, later went on to join the Communist Party, basically you either died in this period or you ended up the Communist Party, um, and, and was, was uh, taught how to write properly by Mao in the 1930s uh, during what was called his reification campaign, which is when he opposed his ideology on how everything worked. Uh, this guy here, Sifu, he died in 1915. Um, he was uh, important in terms of encouraging anarchists in Guangzhou in particular to enter into popular struggles and to get involved in kind of union and peasant movements. And the last one is the most famous one, which is Beijing. Um, he, in fact, didn't really have a big role to play until quite late. Um, he was in Paris in, during the key events of 1927, which we'll talk about in a while. And again, he survived, so he later became a, an official communist writer, and they got him to rewrite his novels and take the pictures of the Cunan out of the novels and the pictures of Marx and the walls instead. This period culminates in what's called the May Fourth Movement, so that's 1919. And what happens is uh, China isn't given a seat at the negotiations that set up the League of Nations. Uh, this results in huge student riots, and they throw open the gates of the foreign ministry officials and they burn the, uh, the, the, the main minister's house down. In fact, the guy who throws open the gates is another anarchist, uh, Kun Hussain, also another guy who ended up in the Communist Party. Uh, the May Fourth Movement was very pro-Western in the fight against tradition. It wanted to smash traditional Chinese uh, culture, but it was also fiercely anti-imperialist in relation to Western and Japanese humiliation of China. That was the humiliation they saw going on in terms of the negotiations. Now, what's interesting is up to this point, uh, the peasants and the tiny working class that existed played a very passive role in terms of all these events. These have been led by, uh, you know, the kind of the, the, the people that have gone to these new universities and the new office that are called a very tiny section of Chinese society. However, China is a society of hundreds of millions of people, so you're still talking about a movement of tens of millions. Um, by 1920, the population of China is in the region of 450 million, of whom only 6% live in cities. The working class was tiny. In 1919, there was one million factory workers, so that's one million out of 450 million. Uh, and even if you use working class in the general sense of anybody involved in transport and all that sort of thing, uh, you're talking about no more than 5% of the entire population, of which only half of percent are industrial workers. At this stage, yeah, the labor movement is starting to emerge, and the anarchists are a significant force in this. 
Ling Meng Zhang was an associate of the Anarchist Society for the Study of Socialism and translator of Kropotkin's Conquest of Bread, and he set up the first Labour Journal, which was just called Labour, in 1918. Gung Tsao was the centre of this movement, and in 1918, the Anarchists helped organise uh, the Tea House Labour Union, which had 11,000 members. The following year, they organised the Barbers Union, and they were also influential through another guy in terms of the Mechanics Union. By 1921, in fact, the anarchists in Gunzau had organised at least 40 different unions there. Uh, they'd also made efforts at rural organisation. Waves of anarchists had gone to the countryside, uh, especially in the May 4th period. And uh, before 1920, due to anarchist efforts, part of Fujian had become, become known as the Soviet Russia of Southern Fujian. Um, we'll talk in a minute as to the Russian thing. Uh, the actual conditions for the peasantry vary considerably uh, from one part of China to another, but in general it's true that there's huge numbers of people trying to live on very tiny amounts of land, so even so-called rich peasants have very tiny holdings. Most of the land is owned by 10% of the population. Uh, the end of the traditional Confucian system brought about by the Republican Revolution also meant the end of relatively paternalistic social relationships that existed in the village. And instead, it's replaced with the sort of free, increasingly free market capitalism, uh, which was uh, ruthless market based absentee landlords or corporations which were acting through local agents. Uh, rents could easily take up 45% of production, and the irregular land taxes I talked about, that's these warlords coming in and taking 30 years tax off you, could eat everything else that existed. Massive famines and death by starvation were not uncommon. Uh, they tended to be triggered by extreme weather and crop failure, but you got that every few years. So by 1919, the Republican revolutionaries had come, become dis quite disillusioned with Western liberalism, in particular because of the way China is treated at the Paris Peace Conference. And in the Russian Revolution is initially understood uh, to be an anarchist event. Uh, again, there's no real Marxist tradition in China at this time. The anarchist journal Labour, which I mentioned earlier, was the first journal to discuss the revolution in depth, and it portrayed it as a revolution in perfect harmony with anarchist aspirations. There is, however, a slow growth of Leninism. Shen Daxu, who I've showed you earlier, became a Marxist, and in 1921 he called the first Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. Some 13 delegates attended this Congress, uh, representing 57 members, but many of the delegates were actually anarchists. Uh, the Communist Party was just one initiative among many attempts to build communist parties. Yong Chiang and John Holliday say there were at least seven groups, one claimed as many as 11,000 members, but it had had something nobody else did, and that was it had the Moscow franchise. Uh, so what that meant was that between 20, 1921 and 1922, 94% of the funding came from Moscow. What that meant was that almost all the active members, and there weren't that many of them, became full-time organisers, and they bookshops in all the major cities, and they had a subsidised paper. And one of these organisers was the son of a relatively rich peasant from Hunan, and that's Mao. Um, he gave up his job to work full-time for the party. Uh, the kind of photos of them were kind of interesting, 1927, 1936, and 1946, because you can sort of see in 1936 the... Uh, Communists were having a pretty hard time. So it's, it's quite well reflected in these features. Anarchist numbers actually continued to grow, even in, even in the early 20s. Uh, between 1921 uh, and 22, there were 92 anarchist societies established, most of them with their own publications. The peak of the movement in 1922, uh, there were over 70 anarchist publications. Print runs for books around 5,000, so literacy would have been relatively low. Uh, postcards of famous anarchists were printed in runs of 50,000. The number of anarchists was probably never that great. Uh, Zhao Xing, somebody else became a communist later on, uh, writing Mutual Aid Monthly in 1923, estimated there were then 5,000 anarchists, uh, uh, several thousand anarchists active in China. As the real story of what's going on in Russia starts to emerge in 21-22, they hear about Kronstadt, all this sort of stuff, a big row blows up with the Communist Party about what all this means, and Chinese anarchist literature is dominated by this. Um, and the fact that CP was fearful of, of the anarchist influence is shown because in 1922, Shen uh, Lek Su responded to a proposal to move the Communist Party headquarters to Gunzhou, which was the strength, the, sort of the anarchist stronghold at the time, by saying anarchists are all over this place, spreading slanderous rumours about us, how can we possibly move there? Yet despite the much longer period of activity, the much longer period of anarchist activity, and the much greater numbers, <coughs> the anarchists failed to get any sort of national or even strong regional coordination together. And part of the reason this fa for this failure was government repression, but the major uh, reason was the failure of all Chinese anarchists to take organisational coherence seriously at all. 
Dali, that historian I mentioned, argues that in the 20s, Chinese anarchists, philosophically suspicious of political organization, were not able to coordinate their activities sufficiently to compete with the communists for any length of time. The communists are also coming up with something new. So in 1922, on Moscow's orders, uh, the communists are ordered to merge with the KMT. Um, this alliance immediately allowed the, co- allowed the communists to go through this period of massive sustained growth. Its 195 members in July of 1922 became 58,000 by the spring of 1927. The KMT, for its part, received military support and training from Moscow, and in particular the Russians trained an officer corps in modern military techniques around which the KMT army was formed. One of these Russian trained officers was a guy called uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek is going to become the leader of the nationalists, will be the guy Mao fights for the next period of time and eventually will head to Taiwan, which remains a separate uh, state or, or semi-state from, from China. So the first indication of trouble within this KMT, Communist Party Alliance, uh, came when Chiang Kai-shek launched a surprise attack on the left and the Communist Party in Guangzhou on March 26. I mean, Chiang Kai-shek had been trained by the Russian military by advisors they sent over. He'd also gone to Moscow, but he wasn't an idiot. He kind of knew what the Russians were up to. Uh, the Communist Party response to this was actually to stay quiet and to try and continue to build influence within what was called the KMT left. The KMT, broad organisation of the left and the right and the left plan to kind of infiltrate the left. Uh, news of what had happened to the Communists in Guangzhou was actually suppressed in Moscow. The papers were ordered not to carry it. Um, the other thing that's happening is there's a growing wave of peasant rebellions all over the country and the Communist Party's main reaction to this is actually c- to condemn peasant excesses. And the reason they're doing that is because they fear it's going to uh, alienate progressive bourgeoisie in the KMT that they're trying to run, o- uh, they're trying to win over. Uh, Chen Duxo himself warns that an agrarian policy which is too radical would create a contradiction between the army and the government in which the Communist Party is participating. The majority of army officers come from a background of small landowners who would be the first people to suffer in an agrarian reform. In 1926, what's called the Northern Offensive begins. Um, and in this, the Communist Party is able to mobilize some 2 million peasants and workers in support of the offense, which is commanded by Chen Kai-shek. So at this stage, despite what's happened, they're still working together. In September 26, they take Wuhan, which I showed you earlier, and the government is established that's actually the left KMT, so they control that city. And it's under the direct influence of a Bolshevik advisor called Baradon, who'd been sent over. Uh, the, the influence of the left is massive in this period. They, they, you know, they're building a big union movement and everything else. It culminates in March 21st, 1927, when in advance of Chiang Kai-shek arriving, there's a huge general strike in Shanghai, and that rapidly takes control of the city, some, t- some six days before he arrives. Chiang Kai-shek recognises there's a danger for him here, um, and what he does, he decides to put an end to it. So on arrival in Shanghai, he gets funds from local merchants and bankers, um, and he also incorporates the, uh, the Northern Army, which they've been fighting, into his own army. On April the 12th, in alliance with local gangsters, he's a long-standing relationship with them, uh, and the police of the French Quarter, so they were the kind of imperialist police forces that were looking after the Westerners, Westerners in Shanghai, uh, they launched a vicious attack on the Communist Party and on working class organisation in general. Um, you run into various figures in terms of exactly how many casualties there were as a result of that, uh, but there's documentation of hundreds being killed and at least five or 6,000 people disappeared. Uh, disaster for the Communist Party follows disaster for the rest of this year. Uh, in Moscow, Stalin is engaged with his fight with Trotsky, and as part of this, he's trying to get some success in China. So they're ordering rising after rising, trying to salvage something, all of which fail, and simply result in the complete destruction of local Communist Party organization, because failed risings are followed by, obviously, repression and execution. Uh, the, la- the order for the last of the urban risings at Guangzhou uh, was actually opposed by the local Communist Party leader, who wrote, an uprising in Guangzhou is out of the question at this time. It was ordered anyway, and something like 6,000 people were massacred in the aftermath. But in Moscow, it could briefly be reported as a success. By this period of time, 1927, the anarchists are pretty much a spent force in China. The remnants, or a section of the remnants, even end up entering the KMT in this period because they see in the suppression of the communist uh, union organizations a chance to build independent ones. This is a fairly short-lived experience. The uh, KMT are initially allowed them to do it, but once they decide that's no longer needed, they suppress them as well. So this period in terms of the Communist Party history, and from here on in, that's essentially what we're talking about. 
from 1921 to the disasters in 1927 can be seen as a fairly orthodox period where the Communist Party is implementing a line coming from Moscow which says you have to concentrate on the urban working class and you have to try and build an alliance with the progressive bourgeoisie, a very sort of classic one. But the problem in China in particular was that that industrial working class was tiny, so when the Communist Party launched risings based on it, they just resulted in the working class getting massacred. In the aftermath of, the, of these risings being defeated, the KMT didn't control the whole country, they controlled the big urban areas. So the Communist Party was forced to retreat to the, uh, the countryside. Now, during the 1926 uh, rising in Hunan, which was a big peasant rising involving about two to three million people, uh, Mao had gone there and produced a report called uh, Report of an Investigation into the Peasant Movement in Hunan. And this brief report basically encapsulates what's become, become the new strategy of the Communist Party. So he opens with a bold statement that says, in a very short time in China's central, southern and northern provinces, several hundred million peasants will rise like a mighty storm, like a hurricane, a force so swift and violent that no power, however great, will be able to hold it back. They will smash all the trammels that bind them and rush forward along the road to liberation. Actually, could write in this period. Maybe we get really orthodox and boring. <laughs> um, and far from following this party line of condemning peasant excesses, he writes, "What the peasants are doing is absolutely right. What they are doing is fine. And also that, to put it bluntly, it is necessary to create terror for a while in every rural area." So Mao's strategy essentially is one of encouraging a kind of very violent class war in the countryside, uh, and particularly encouraging the poor peasantry to publicly terrorise, torture, and often kill the local gentry and landlords. And the thinking behind this is this is going to burn bridges in terms of destroying existing rural relationships. If these guys' relatives come back, they're going to kill everybody who participated in this. Uh, the peasants are therefore forced uh, to join the Red Army and to organise with the, as part of the Red Army in order to defend these new liberated zones. Uh, he establishes a base area there in the Chang Kan Shan Mountains, which I'm sure I'm butchering, uh, on the borders of Hunan. And this was what's called the First Jinxi Soviet. Um, and with the defeat of the Communist Party in the cities, this basically means that everybody starts retreating into these areas. Um, and they managed to bring some units of the Nationalist Army that they'd infiltrated over with them. The base areas are in isolated regions and rugged terrain, uh, which made it very difficult for the KMT armies to mobilise against them. And, you know, your kind of classic Maoist guerrilla warfare strategy that you then saw being imitated all over the world, this is obviously where it starts. Uh, the KMT military, however, learned from the failures, and uh, in 1932, uh, they actually declared a Chinese Soviet Republic based on these areas. But by 1934, uh, the military have worked out how to actually militarily defeat these. Um, and the military defeat of the Jiangxi Soviet is what leads to the other bit of Chinese history people have heard of, which is the famous Long March. Uh, so this is a nice map of China, um, and it gives you an idea of the actual size of the Long March. 10,000 miles uh, involved a retreat from the area of the Jiangxi Soviet down here, right down, this is all mountains by the way, all the way up into northern China. Uh, the conventional Maoist history of the march talks about a skirmish every day and a battle every two weeks. But actually, to try and read any detailed history of these events, they don't exist. Um, and certainly, uh, Zhang Qing and John Holiday have argued that, to a large extent, Chiang Kai-shek let, let the Red Army go, and that a lot of these battles are, in fact, simply propaganda inventions. There were some skirmishes, but nothing that big. However, there's no argument that conditions in the march themselves were horrendous. They were trying to cross snow-covered mountains in winter. There was, very, uh, there was an extreme shortage of food. Out the 90 to 100,000 who set out, only, only 7,000 to 8,000 people actually arrived. Those who survived the march uh, were going to go on and form the future cadre of the Communist Party uh, and the Chinese state. And it's part of the reason why Mao had such an intense party loyalty, because they'd all gone through this common experience. During the Long March, the international situation is changing, and so is the line from Moscow, because we've seen the growth of fascism in the West. Uh, so what happens uh, also in this period is uh, Japan has started to attack China, starting in the north, it's taking Korea, and then it's starting to come down from northern China and taking increasing areas of territory. Because the Chinese army is so backward, Chiang Kai-shek is using the slogan of unification and then resistance. And by this he means, first of all, I'm going to wipe out the remaining law warlords and the Communist Party, I'm going to unify the country, and then I'm going to fight the Japanese. Um, so on Moscow's instructions, uh, what happens is the Communist Party starts to demand an alliance uh, with the KMT uh, and say we need to form you know, a popular front, we need to all, all us Chinese now to stand together against 
uh, Japanese imperialism. The county in this period has had you know, a long period where it controls you know, large areas of China. It's had a chance to put its policies into practice. It's had a chance to de demonstrate that it could modernise the country. And it's pretty much completely failed. And it's failed for the same reason that Chang couldn't reform. Because its, it's, its base was very much based on uh, the landlords um, and the very people whose interest it was to see no particular change. Uh, so even if you pass the law limiting rent, the guy, the, you know, your local judge was the local landlord, peasant goes to the court, he's not going to get any justice from it. In terms of the, um, the, the war against Japan, the communists were able to make enormous propaganda out of that war. The KMT army just wasn't militarily organised in a way that it could actually uh, conduct an offensive against the Japanese. And in reality, what happens is they slowly lose control of more and more areas of China. Uh, the communists make a huge amount of noise about fighting the Japanese, but in fact, there's no really big offensives. There's two. Uh, this one, the uh, 100 Regiment Offensive, takes place in 1940. There's a smaller one in 1941. That's the only real conventional warfare. There is a certain amount of guerrilla warfare, though, so effectively, like was going to happen in Vietnam later, they managed to rule areas by day, and the Japanese managed to rule areas by night. Uh, Japanese uh, policy against guerrilla resistance is to brutally put it down, and that has the effect of pushing more and more peasants in, into the Red Army. So in that sort of context, there's no real mystery why in the course of the war, almost all classes in China came to see the Communist Party as offering a much better hope for, for the future than the KMT. Uh, for the peasants, the Communist Party had actually dropped any radical program of land reform, but what they did do was they actually uh, implemented the KMT laws of rent control. So although the same legal situation existed in both territories, in the, in the Communist controlled regions, the rents were actually controlled, in the KMT regions they weren't. To the elite, the Communist Party appeared to be leading a long sought after wave of modernization and delivering effective governments. Uh, the KMT of the situation, apart from the landlord thing, which was riddled with corrupt officials who were just putting as much money as possible in their pockets. Communist Party at the stage, this isn't true. They were trying to deliver a fairly non corrupt government, and while there were problems with incompetency, there wasn't so much in the way of problems with corruption. Uh, for the peasants, they kept the landlords and money of the lenders under control. What this results basically, and the, um, after the end of the Second World War, the Russians invade the uh, Japanese control areas of northern China and of course hand these over to the Communist Party. The Americans on the other hand then ship the nationalist forces and arm them and uh, a big war basically develops at the end of that. But the nationalists lose that war. In 1949, the, um, the Red Army in, enters Beijing, and just after that, Chiang Kai-shek flees with his remaining forces to Taiwan, and the communists control the whole country. When Mao uh, announces the end of this, he actually does it in nationalist terms. He says that China has stood up, uh, they were the words, and that this was a victory of the national bourgeois democratic revolution. Uh, the Chinese flag, which consists of four small stars, as well as a big red one, in fact represents the alliance that's said to bring this victory about, which was the workers, the peasants, the middle class, and the progressive, or the kind of nationalist capitalist class. From an amateur's perspective, more interesting and greatly unexplored question is the failure of Chinese anarchism to provide any alternative in that earlier period, despite the fact that in the 1920s it had everything going for it. Um, primarily, it seems to be partly failure to break out of its origins as an ide ideology of the most radical section of the Republican elite. And as I said, they're drawn from a very narrow section of society. There were anarchists who successfully built labour organisations, there were anarchists who went to the countryside and organised among peasants, but the movement as a whole refused to organise beyond this and paid the price for it as things became increasingly polarised between the KMT and the Communist Party and it became a question of which side you were on. <laughs> worth mentioning that the American general who was in charge back in the KMT and eventually lost was George C. Marshall, who then went back from China to America and said, listen guys, if we don't put a whole load of money back into Europe now, we're going to lose Europe as well. So does the origins of the Marshall Plan come from the loss of China as well? Do you have any questions? <laughs> uh, I, I read a book called The Landmark, and it might have been one of those hagiographies. Mm. It was by a communist and but it seemed like Mao did some great things at the start. Like, I know he did some terrible things later on, but he did seem like a pretty inspirational guy. And, uh, I don't know. Just, just to throw that in there. Is it true that Mao 
was had a lot of contact with anarchists when he was in Europe as well in the early days. Or did he come from a lot of anarchist originally? Background himself, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of um, supposedly the Kropotkin. Pretty much everybody was influenced by anarchism. I, I'm not sure he was ever a member of any group, but pretty much everybody on the left in China in that period was, was influenced by anarchism because the only stuff you could read in terms of stuff that was coming into the country were, was anarchist, you know, translations of Kropotkin in particular, you know, Sun Wukong and all that sort of stuff. There was no translation of Marxism at all until about 1920. Like, it just didn't exist. So, you know, people, had, it, it, there wasn't really much of a, a, an awareness of, of, of Marx in that context. I think the, the thing about Mao is actually, the interesting thing about that is it's really hard to actually find any biography of him that isn't Mao's this incredible saviour figure, the great helmsman idea, like Mao comes up with all these brilliant turns and directs things through, or Mao's this kind of evil you know, demon with rotting teeth who you know, eats a whole chicken a day and rapes young women in the party. You know, and that basically the two bio- you know, the biographies you come across, the, that's what you get out of it. Uh, so, and that's generally a problem with the history of the whole revolution period. In fact, the problem beyond it is that it's very hard to find any history that isn't focused on Mao. What Mao did this, what did Mao, you know, maybe Mao's bad, maybe Mao's good, but it's all based on Mao did this, Mao did that, Mao did this. Doesn't really explain what happens, you know, in a country of 450 million at the start, uh, you know, heading towards a billion at the end. And even in terms of, I mean, I was kind of fo- forced to focus in in terms of keeping this short, but, um, I mean, in terms of the liberated areas, you know, the area Mao initially controlled was only one such area. There were several other ones controlled by other people in the Communist Party, some of whom, in fact, had previously been anarchists as well. Um, I'd say an antidote to reading that book would probably be to uh, read the John Holiday um, Chang biography, which is, that's the kind of rotting teeth demon version of the same story. Um, and, I mean, you know, their approach to it is that basically a conventional history of Mao is entirely an invention, you know, that the, you know, it, huge battles were invented afterwards. And, you know, there's a kind of believable side to that as well. I think they take their arguments. I mean, you read their argument, you go, this is kind of bats. And then you read the kind of stuff on his side, and you go, this is kind of bats. And somewhere between these two crazy versions of history, there's probably some truth, but actually digging them out of either isn't particularly possible. I think the big challenge is finding something you could read that you know wouldn't be either Mao the Great Helmsman never made a mistake, he was brilliant, and all the problems were blamed on him losing power temporarily, or you know the complete opposite of that, which is what we there's, actually get. There's a book that I suppose gave a bit of balance. It's not political. It's called uh, The Wild Swans. It's about three women mm. living in China, three generations of women, and that presents. Well, I suppose the realities of peasant life or, or life for women and families in China. And that was entirely, entirely different to the kind of long march, heroic, conquering man. It was more about the difficulties of the Chinese. And that's, that's just, I think, a, a biography. I think it's a biography. In fact, the author of that book is the one who then went on, went on with Halliday to write this kind of crazy anti So, <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I mean, her particular perspective is her parents were a communist party and were later purged. Because I, I don't go into that history at all, but Mao in part turns against all these former allies every time they actually try and control his behaviour. Uh, so he's repeated periods of coming in and out of power and purging people. Um, and in terms of their history, you know, they say, oh, well, he was doing this all along, you know, on a smaller scale. But right from the 1920s, he was manoeuvring to put his enemies into a bad place and get them killed. And then he was building himself up on that sort of basis. But I don't find, I mean, neither in a way are satisfactory history because it doesn't really tell you what the hell everything else is happening. You know, why, you know, why was there a revolution in China? It can't have been down to Mao was either the great helmsman or Mao was an evil demon who had a lot of chicken. Neither of those are good explanations. So what I was trying to dig into was what they were. And it, it seems to me that what really brought the Communist Party to power more than anything else was the complete inability of the Chinese ruling class outside of them, first of all in terms of the Chang industry, then in terms of the KMT, to actually modernise the country to any extent whatsoever. Um, I mean, the other thing that's relevant is, you know, like you get quite a lot of vitriolic anti Mao stuff that's based on, well, Mao killed 20 million people, blah, 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 which is true. But actually, the previous regime was also killing 20 million people. 20 million people were being killed all the time in China. It was, it was just part of the kind of background noise to an extent. So it also doesn't really explain very much. Um, but, it, you know, that, that is an illustration of how bad the KMT government to be, and also how bad the warlord period was, where you just had these huge wars going on constantly with 
you know, basically land grab was, you know, mobilizing huge armies of people who'd been forced conscripts and who would frequently starve to death on their way to the front line or on the retreat because nobody really gave a damn about what happened to peasant soldiers anyway. How true do you reckon it is? I, I've heard a bit that one of the reasons for the, the anarchist movement in China get to a certain size and influence and then more or less stop it there and stagnating was that one of the, the very dominant ideas among them in the early years of the last century was this thing of perfecting the individual, uh, making yourself a better person, then creating alternatives that would show your ideas in action. Uh, I suppose really what we call now sort of lifestyleism and you know the creation of minor alternative models, so that they they uh, it tend to be only a minority who sort of were stuck in like you know stuff that was happening there. Like that, that's one, one thing I've heard. But a couple, couple of other points is that another influence in China was the Korean anarchists who had been possibly at one stage the biggest force in the anti-imperialist war in Japan to expel the Japanese invaders and in China it was a very big Korean uh, emigrant community you had the Korean Anarchist Communist Federation of Manchuria and the Korean Anarchist Federation of Southern China both which produced numerous papers, periodicals and had meeting halls and beer halls and whatever, you know, like a whole culture thing, a bit like sort of, you know, your Irish club in London except it was all run by, by anarchists uh, and again, like after the, the, the victory of Mao, any mention of them just vanishes. Like we know that in Korea, they survived as a, a considerable force till the end of the Second World War, and then they were really squeezed between Stalin's creation in North Korea and the Syngman Rhee uh, dictatorship in South Korea, which is financed by the Americans, both of whom went to town on any form of dissidence at all. And I think the Korean anarchist movement didn't start reappearing until the 1970s, 1980s, as more than a few individuals. And it's still a very confused movement these days because the, uh, I suppose the question that they're asking is probably one that was asked in China at the time: is is socialism on the agenda in China? A lot of people, all we can do is make an anti-feudal revolution. The material conditions don't exist yet for socialism. Not creating enough of. A surplus in production, which is why people also lined up with the KMT and sometimes with the early CP. And I think there might have been an element of that in in Korea as well. But the big question is like, is it just something that some historian has made up now, or is it actually the case that one of their sort of debilitating mm. things was this emphasis on perfecting the individual and creating alternatives at the expense of going and getting stuck in where loads of people were moving already? I, I briefly, I'd say no. Uh, it, it's oversimplifying the question. Um, and in fact, one illustration of why it's oversimplifying it is that individualist lifestyle approach, like the idea that what we have to do is change man, we have to change people's behaviour, wasn't just true of the anarchist movement, it was also true of the communist party. I mean, it's really what distinguishes Maoism from more orthodox communism was this idea that you could remake people, you know, that you could remake the peasantry, that you could, you know, that perform wonders by just motivating people to work very hard. And it, that's probably partially to do with the sort of anarchist influence. There was this emphasis on transforming the individual. Um, you know, and part of that was breaking with the old trains. What I think was much more problematic um, was a failure to move from a kind of theoretical space to an actual practical organisation space. But again, that's also an oversimplification because Gonzalez, I talked about massive anarchist in involvement in uh, labor unions and, and organising things like that, but they never really got their act together beyond that. So as, as wars became greater and larger scale, the fact that they had no coordination with anybody else in the country became a bigger and bigger problem. And the arguments were like, well, we've got nice ideas, but we're not terribly effective, we can organise a union here, but there's a huge war going on. Those arguments became stronger and stronger reasons to support the Communist Party. Uh, there was also a lot of... Um, there was a problem as well with the fact that most of these people were coming from the very wealthy strata of, of Chinese society. I mean, I'm not talking about students in the context of Dublin or something. I'm talking about, you know, your top 1%. You're, you know, you're almost talking about your sons and daughters of Tommy O'Reilly. You know, that's true of all the revolutions. Communist Party, Nationalists, everybody, that's where they're actually coming from. Um, so that was always a bit of a barrier. But the, yeah, I mean, there was, there was a significant move to the countryside in northern China, actually in the Korean border, and that may be part of the reason why you saw that particular movement emerging around China. The other big problem, though, you have is that there's very limited information, right? And the 
information that is available in English is the information that's been translated by Western academics like Derlich, who are interested in anarchism as a postmodern philosophy and the influences it may have had in the Communist Party. So what they do is they translate all these really long-winded essays about evolutionary theory of the, the new man, but they don't translate any of the, you know, that journal I talk of Labour, for instance, as far as I know, it, there's no translation from that whatsoever. So from the perspective of somebody who knows very little about the period, who doesn't speak Chinese, who can't go and do primary research, it's very hard to find out what really was happening. There's hints that there's more going on than you get from those histories, but there are only really hints. Yeah, um, so it was very interesting the whole thing, but uh, uh, it remind me of um, my first actually uh, the kind of uh, how you call it uh, contact with China, right? And I was a kid, and uh, my grandmother used to buy me books of Pearl Pack that she was she had lived in China for a period where, and it was purely fiction, fictional but they were representing a country that was more, much more humane um, from the autocratic imperialistic China to the Chai Kan Cheng's uh, nationalistic to the Matsuko Japanese uh, China in the north and the Mao's revolutionary it seems that the, everybody was treating the people of China even before that like a, a, like a big mass, like a flock without faces. And all these executions of 20 million people before and after, and you know, like they, they, all these things coming back, all the massive relocations of people taking them from one place that they're still going on uh, when they want to build a dam, as happened okay. basically. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like uh, they, 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 to me, they have failed to put a face on the everyday individual and for an amount of people as the Chinese people uh, uh, count it at the moment it's it's really I don't know if I can say sad but it, I, I, I can't understand how a few anarchists or a few revolution, extreme revolutionists they will have made that change at that stage, when you have all these masses that can be manipulated, or even suppressed, or even executed, or even dislocated that easily, it's are there any uh, regime? Like, doesn't matter what is the face of the regime, you know, if it's imperialistic, or nationalistic, or even uh, communist, communo, communistic under the face of Mao. So, and then as as everybody understands here. Uh, if you don't have a knowledge, as I had a fictional knowledge, from fictional writing, or I've been as well there, I've seen the, the place now, for four years back, but um, you really can't understand what's happening there. It's a vast country, and actually a lot of people that don't have an idea what is the face of the Chinese, what is the, the culture, it's not that, you know, like the vastness of the place, you know, it's really drinking, you know. I think we could say, historically speaking, anarchism doesn't seem to do too well in countries that start off with night, enormous areas of 95% penalty, which where sort of the people end up making the history of ones with who create the biggest army that goes around and says, you do what we tell you, we want to shoot you. Um, and that's probably yeah. a fact of, you know, sort of evolution of possibilities and so on, uh, maximum notwithstanding. Um, but, you know, China in the 1920s and China in 2008 is a very, very different place. And from our point of view, particularly as the way things are developing internationally, um, our, one of our sort of international priorities surely must be to, to support the growth of Chinese language anarchism in whatever way we can. I have no idea what we, how we would start doing that. I suspect we'd probably start um, with... Um, Chinese diaspora communities, really, that are already sort of present both here in Ireland and then throughout Europe and so on, and sort of communicate backwards in that way, rather than turning up in China and getting restless. Did you come across anything about uh, Chinese anarchists in recent years? The only thing I've come across, other than sort of the odd individual or some very small circulation magazine in San Francisco or that type of thing was uh, after the 
Mao's cultural revolution in the mid 60s, which was like just a power grab by him against another faction bureaucracy. But he got a whole lot of people wound up, and some of those who took sort of revolution stuff a bit too serious had to get out very fast. And a group of ended up in Hong Kong and called themselves the, the, the 70s Front, which wasn't the year, it was the district that they ended up living in Hong Kong, it was called the 70s, and produced uh, a lot of material that uh, was anarchist and sort of libertarian Marxist. But that's I clearly like to come out of China in the late 60s, what that means there must have been some continuity of ideas somehow despite the, the dictatorship that China was just when like has it come to light in more recent years I can't say now I've done any big search in it because I've been mostly focusing on this historical period um, I haven't come across anything big outside of individuals and publications uh, I mean, there would be a certain amount of knowledge because in terms of I mean the official communist history basically is a fairly neat story of the progression of ideas. So the anarchists do have a place in it. You know, like you have first of all you have the Taipan peasant insurrectionaries who, you know, had the you know, didn't really have any of the right ideas at all, but were doing something, and then you have the Republicans, and then you have the anarchists for this brief period up to about 1915, 16, you know, it was okay to be an anarchist, and then in 1917 everybody learns that Marxism is the answer. Uh, the Communist Party is founded and it's all straightforward from therein. But it does mean that at least some of the early anarchist writings is still in circulation, it's okay to study them, you know, it's not they're not forbidden because if they're written in that period, that's sort of okay. And providing you understand that you learn the lessons. But yeah, modern movements I don't know. I mean I, I guess like with most things in China it'd be quite it would be difficult to to actually organise and if you were you probably wouldn't be that visible. Well, Just 10 o'clock, so I was going to do yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. You're here. Thank you. Thank you.